now we yet have another um, kind of category of, of presentations, and that is uh, about how we can organize um, ourselves as a field uh, in the Netherlands and also beyond that in a better way, in a more effective way to yeah, do research but also look at these grand challenges. Now, first, I'll uh, give the word to Albert. Yes, Many ways we uh, can collaborate, and of course, this is not only an academic group, and that's what we want to focus the discussion on. Uh, but before doing so, I want to mention uh, an initiative that we have taken with a whole group of people, not only in academics, but also industry, to start to build a PV industry in the Netherlands and in Europe. And this very much links to what we heard in the case uh, initial talk, that we need to work better also in Europe to get our own PV industry. And this is a proposal for what's called the National Growth Fund. It's called Circular Integrated High Efficiency Solar Panels. And the idea is to build this industry in the Netherlands focusing on new PV concepts and products uh, on, a, on a gigawatt scale. And I'll show you what these uh, products are. The National Growth Fund is a stimulation fund of the government to kick off new innovations and new industry that then in the long term, of course, has to be economically viable by itself. But as we've seen also in China in the past and also now in the US, the, the kickstart to the government is essential to make the industry uh, make a start. So that's this proposal. And uh, it links directly to the climate agreement in the Netherlands. Uh, you know, we heard big numbers in gigawatts and terawatts uh, installations uh, earlier in Pietro's talk. In the Netherlands, we have 18 gigawatts uh, installed right now. And the climate agreement, if we want to be climate neutral in 2050, tells us we need to install about 100 to 250 gigawatt peak. Right? There's no discussion about that. This, ha this will happen. Right? This has to happen and it will happen. That's already the plan. Which means we have to install about, uh, you know, the order of up to 10 gigawatt peak per year. So if you build up an industry that can, you know, fabricate 10 gigawatts per year, you do something that's useful in the scale of our country, it would be sufficient. If you could scale that up then by another factor of 10, you do something that is really uh, you know, practical on the European scale. And that's our goal. So the total area of this is more than 1,000 square kilometers. That's something you have to imagine. It's very as a densely populated country as the Netherlands. We have to find a thousand square kilometer to put all these solar panels on. That also drives new ideas uh, that will show uh, for PV new kinds of products we need to develop. Now, if we want to install all that PV, we've already heard uh, you know, from Pietro. Yeah, that's the production going up over years. And this is the annual production in Gigawatt Peak. And 97% of that comes from China. And that, of course, is obviously a strategic risk for us in Europe. And uh, like I said before, it's much better if we can diversify all over the world, basically, where we fabricate uh, the solar uh, technology. So we want to grasp this economic opportunity, because that's also what it is. I mean, we're going to spend tens of billions of euros a year just to install solar panels here in the Netherlands. And in our proposal, we're uh, uh, proposing to build a fab that will uh, fabricate silicon solar cells in the Netherlands. And then I told you, you have to find this uh, 1,000 square kilometers of solar area. So lightweight and flexible solar foils would be extremely useful because half of the roofs that we have in the Netherlands cannot carry the weight of a standard silicon solar panel. So new products, flexible and lightweight PV, is a second uh, program line that we uh, will develop. And then finally, to find even more area and to aesthetically you know, incorporate PV in our environment, wouldn't it be nice if we could just invisibly integrate PV in our buildings and in our roofs? And we already have several companies in the Netherlands that do this already on a small scale, and our proposal also uh, funds the innovations to make these integrated products both in buildings but also in uh, vehicles. I mentioned here the companies that are involved in our plan. There are existing companies that have raised the funds of investors to make this plan a reality in combination with the subsidy that we ask from the government. And then, very important, aside from the companies, is the role of TNO in technology development and Soda Lab, which is the collaboration of all the academic partners in the Netherlands. So what are we going to really do? Technically, the solar cell factory that will be built in, uh, in the province of Groningen will develop heterogeneous solar cells. It's the next generation silicon solar cells. That's the idea. With many examples and many advantages, next step in efficiency, a lower CO2 footprint to fabricate. The solar foils, this is a big risky project because it has to be developed still. It's innovation, it doesn't exist. That's why there's a lot of investments at TNO 
And Hyatt, as a company, is already involved in fabricating foils made out of silicon and could make the switch to perovskites. So lightweight and flexible, even lower CO2 fit footprint to fabricate, very low materials use. And then finally, I mentioned this program line on the building and vehicle integrated PV products. So the capacity that we build adds up to on the order of 7 gigawatt peak per year. Right? And I mentioned to you that's roughly what we need in the Netherlands over the long term. Once this works, once this factory, this is all innovation to be demonstrated on a large scale, once it's operational, we can scale it up and it will be scaled up and then multiplied at many locations in Europe. So then the total scale will be much larger than what we initially had proposed. So uh, that requires a big investment. So we asked 300 million from the National Growth Fund and there's private investors and also parallel investments that we've already made that can help this uh, kick off. So right now, we're waiting for the outcome of this procedure at the National Growth Fund, where we can get this kickoff fund. And I should say, that's we don't know. It can happen, and we're all happy. We're going to really do this on a short scale. If it doesn't get granted this year, we'll find other ways. Because look, there's these investors that are ready to help and stimulate the fabrication of these products. So we have to be careful. And it's our first you know, start to see if we can get this going. Uh, but if not, uh, grant, then we'll find other ways. So, just to show that this is not just something of a small group of people, I mean, there's these companies involved, they know, universities. Uh, this is too small to read, but uh, there is equipment builders, many companies in the Netherlands are involved, building companies, startups that make already equipment or materials that are important. On the human capital side, we have to train people that will work at these factories. And the government made policies that also has to match with what we want to do technology-wise. So that is uh, the sort of industrial part of it. And now, I guess Bruno will go on and show how we compose the academic part of the proposal. Yes, thanks, Albert. Um, so you said we and our proposal many times, but then you briefly showed that it's uh, who we is, actually, or who us is. And uh, what I really enjoyed about this uh, um, process was that it was a huge group of people that was involved in writing this and on various levels. You showed all the different companies, the, the the ministries, you know, but also um, basically the entire research landscape in PV in the Netherlands. And that was possible because the Solar Lab exists. The Solar Lab is a collaboration network of all the groups in photovoltaic research and a TNO that work on, yeah, work on photovoltaics. And uh, we've already been talking to each other for about eight years, um, writing a few proposals together. We've been uh, um, uh, collaborating. We've made lists of uh, all the capabilities in the different labs. So when this project started, we were very uh, in a very good position to very quickly write a research program to actually support the industrial activities. I'm also really happy that Pietro already uh, uh, sort of introduced a way of directing research without losing creativity. And so you should be very creative in your research, but make sure that it has a meaning for this transition towards more sustainable or towards more solar in our energy system. And that's also how this, this proposal was, was uh, written. So um, just to give you an overview, this is about 50 research groups in the Netherlands that work together. So we know all of them, and they're all part of this uh, Solar Lab collaboration network. And uh, for the purpose of the proposal, we also just did a calculation how much was actually invested in PV research in the last five years. And amazingly, about 100 million euros were invested in PV research in this country in those 50 groups in the last five years. So that's already a huge basis of knowledge and infrastructure and people that work on PV. So this already makes it possible to um, also make a meaningful difference for this uh, proposal. And of course, then you have to write why you're, you're good. So we've also collected uh, a lot of uh, details on records that were achieved by the, um, by the consortium and so on. But then how do you actually make, up, make a PV proposal? Um, so we, we actually uh, looked at the company plans and then decided on what we can do to help make these plans happen. So I would mention the PV foils, for example, they don't exist yet, so what actually needs to be done to make perovskites stable, to uh, put them on foils, to encapsulate the foils, to test them and so on. So um, it is still fundamental research, but very much inspired by the industrial program. So these are just a few ideas, a few examples, uh, overall they're about um, uh, 60 different projects in this research plan. These are a few of the examples. So you can see on the sort of silicon side, 
Um, we heard about silver and how uh, we cannot go on using silver for these cells because if we make uh, two terawatts a year, uh, we will use more than the silver supply that we have. So going to copper is a, is a key step. And of course, copper may also be a problem, but then more for the wires, not so much for the direct context of the cells. Um, of course, the, the thinner your silicon cell is, the less energy you will use to make it. So that also would help to make these silicon cells thinner. And then also, we have to make these factories very clever in some sense, because uh, we have to compete. Uh, we have to compete with very competitive prices from uh, cells from elsewhere. So the more clever you make a factory, the more automated you make the factory, the, the more realistic it is. Giovanna talked a lot about ions and defects in perovskites. Of course, there's many projects on that, because unless you solve this, they will not be stable. Um, so we, this needs to be solved. But also, you know, considering the more um, environmental factors, such as lead or leakage in the environment, is, is considered in this research plan. And then for the integration, there's many things about light management, but also how can you lower the footprint further, of, for example, solar cells that are encapsulated in plastics. So using bioplastics is one option there, for example, but then bioplastics. I need to also confirm the very high standards of solar panels being in the field for 40 years and you know, being very transparent, etc. And of course, the tandem cells, which we call the ultimate integration, the integrating silicon and perovskites in one cell. There's also many research questions that still could improve the efficiency and stability of the cells. So, overall, this program was really inspired by all the needs of the industry, but still contains all this fundamental research. <coughs> there's a separate program that is carried out by TNO that then translates these research results into. Um, closer to the products, and then finally they're taken up by the company. So this whole value chain of, of research to industrial products is considered in this proposal. So I hope this was sort of a uh, gives you an idea of, of what is in there. Um, but of course, this is a discussion session, so we don't want to stop here with presenting stuff, and we want to give the word to you guys. Um, and we sort of have a few questions for you that we'd like to discuss in the next um, maybe ten minutes or so. I'm not sure how much time we have. Um, so we have. In this solar lab consortium, written a whole um, uh, roadmap for perovskite research and for should do perovskite, but of course, we should also collaborate on all the other topics that we, we work on. And uh, some of these are covered in the uh, but of course, there are probably more topics that we need to collaborate more on to make our research more efficient. Also, what do you need from this network? So, this network is mostly a network of, of PIs at the moment, but of course, you know, the real work is done by, by everybody. So, what do you really want? Do you want more? equipment sharing or access to other labs or what is needed uh, from, the, uh, from your side from this network. And also how can we, maybe there's a broader discussion, how can we use this network to better lobby for PV research, for PV industry in the Netherlands and in Europe and elsewhere. So um, if you also want to come on stage so we can uh, have a sort of open discussion session and um, I would like to ask you to start the discussion. Who would like to start? So we start to start. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh, okay. This one works. Fine. I can also scream. Yeah. 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 Sure. This part. Yeah. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, you basically already mentioned the point uh, in the slides. I saw that six out of the eight technologies that are proposed actually use for rough guide, but there is. Yeah, still challenges to be to be faced. I mean, we don't have any 25-year uh, lifetime warranty perovskite cells as of now, and I was wondering, is there sort of a security that we will uh, yeah, solve these problems before we have to actually roll out? And uh, yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a it's an innovation project, and any innovation project, if you knew before that it will work, we will not. This will be innovation. Would be much clearer path of your research. Uh, it's interesting when it doesn't work yet. And so um, I think this, the program is a mixture. I mean, um, there's silicon in there, very established. We know this will work. Uh, and that's a matter of building the factory in the best possible way. There's the innovation in the factory itself, but we know they will make silicon cells and the cells will work. It's also important to realize if it works, right, you have to be there. You have to be involved. So you cannot take the risk to uh, you know, not be following that uh, trend. Indeed. But is there a third leg besides silicon and perovskite that has been considered, or is it all too? Not at this point. Not as we said. Let's focus on the things where we're strong, and that's it. There are mitigation strategies, so, right? so these integration companies, for example, they will start with silicon, and you know this will work. 
And of course, if perovskites silicon tandems appear, their product will be better, but it will not uh, not exist if the perovskite uh, doesn't work out. But we carefully said here, I mean, yeah, non perovskite there are many other materials that are interesting to work on, like organic PV, other earth abundant materials, and that also links to, uh, I think, Petrus uh, client. I mean, they can inspire new insights about heterogeneous and about materials growth, and they're also important. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually a, a great initiative. I understand that you you wanted to focus on, on what we have already a large expertise, a right, large experience. But what, what I, I miss in in that is that we are not addressing all the aspects of building integrated PV. Right? You're focusing just on one aspect and it's great. But uh, I, I think it would be interesting to also include in that the, the, the other aspects of building integrated PV, so how to use the facades and the windows, so things like luminescent solar concentrators, yeah. where we also have uh, yeah. some expertise present. So that's, uh, yeah, I think that, that for the future, that would be interesting also to address. I that. think we have that freedom, right, in the academic program yeah. to do that as well. Yeah, so I mean, of course, it's something that is at a very low tier L, but just not lower than the flexible PV. No, exactly. So there's no company right now that... Oh, the yeah, there, there are no companies actually. So that's, in that. that's why the, the, so the, main, the main pillars uh, yeah. are the three that you saw. No, that's why I said that I understand, but I mean, if we do get that, it would be interesting to also diversify a little bit to yeah. go for the window and yeah. be more... That's also why in this program in particular there's uh, an open call, three years in, for example, where, where new ideas and new technologies that come up and that, that become important, yeah. uh, they will be considered. Yeah, because for instance, the, the, you could combine uh, what we have already on, on LSCs with bioplastics and uh, yeah, so that, that I mean, that's a very yeah, that could actually work. Yeah, yeah that's true. Thanks. Over there, and then I will show Thanks for uh, uh, initiating the discussion. Uh, I'm Ikarno from TNO. <laughs> Uh, maybe the answer to both of the questions, uh, first for the, the perovskite solar cells, uh, if you look into the, uh, the industry, uh, the stability test on perovskite solar cells has advanced so much and there are companies in the world, one example is the microquantum from China, that can pass the perovskite uh, stability seven times according to the IAC test. It is a module and they are selling it locally in China with the municipality where they are producing it. So it already has become a commercial product for the utility scheme. And the question for, uh, let's say, uh, different type of applications, I think it will be also uh, a natural outcome uh, in this uh, growth cost if it's accepted on by virtue of the second aspect for the flexibility. If you have uh, the possibility to make a flexible uh, thinking in PV, whether it's perovskite, CIDs, or PV, uh, it will give a lot of advantage uh, to apply on the areas where uh, any rigid type of PV cannot be applied. So it's very important. And uh, we should also think maybe a, a suggestion in terms of further development in the Netherlands. There is a, a big variety of research. We have to funnel them through such that within less than a decade, we should see produced first five services in the Netherlands that are placed on the market. Yeah, no, we agree. And uh, that's also you know, part of this plan. There's a clear timeline behind that. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I think there are, if you ask them for new topics, then it's one minute. Yeah? Yes. You ask about new topics uh, for collaboration. I think there is a class of materials, uh, transition metal, dye, and chi uh, chalcogonides that are very strong absorbers and they have a light absorption length of tens of nanometers only. They can be easily processed from solution by liquid phase exfoliation and drop casted in, in large areas. And there are a few initial studies, experimental and theoretical, not yet published, that uh, suggest that there could be carrier multiplication just above twice the band gap, so with a very low onset. So I think that these materials are very uh, yeah, super interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's interesting. Can we also maybe have a question from the student or suggestions? Because we have a question also for you. What do you actually want from a network? Maybe we can see if there's somebody who has an idea. It's 
an opportunity, right? It's a chance yes. to travel, to go, to go be somewhere else. Unless you like it so much here. <laughs> oh my god. Yes, that's all. Well, for example, in our case, we work mostly with um, methods to prepare the perovskite uh, layer. But then we are lacking for uh, techniques to understand the effects or what is happening in the full stack. So how can we collaborate or get more, get more access in that sense? Very good, yeah. Um, so um, in this collaboration network, we have a list of expertises throughout the Netherlands with all the different groups. So in principle, that information is available, but obviously we should make it more available to everyone. There's a, there's a website actually. And I would say the best way is always to just contact either directly or via your, your PI, uh, the other group. That's the idea, right? That's actually what, what we want to do. We want to collaborate uh, on those kind of levels. So that's would be great if you... Like today, you take the chance to do a lab tour, ask somebody from Amol to show you in there, and there's spectroscopic tools that maybe are the ones that you're looking for. Let me set something up. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Alex and Emma. Or oh, Emma first, and Alex. Uh, yeah, maybe commenting then on this question as well. Maybe I'm the only one, but to be honest, I know about the existence of Solar Lab uh, because I've heard it a lot on the NMPV symposium, but I really don't know the expertises of the different partners. So I would say it would just be really nice to have in an NMPV symposium or in some other type of symposium have these short talks from students from different labs where you can really see what their expertises are because I honestly have no yeah. clue. Except for maybe a little bit from Groningen. Yeah. And maybe I'm the only one, so then we don't need yeah. to do it. Oh, no, thank you. Let's find a way how we can do that. Pretty much, yeah. because then I think you also know where to go yeah. when you yeah. have a question, but now I wouldn't know who to contact. Yeah. There's a list on the website, but of course that, yeah. that's uh, very indirect. So I like the yeah. idea of having presentations, very brief presentations. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> today is a post session, so. <laughs> It's a starting point. No, it's clear. It's clear. It's clear. Yeah. 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 Thank you for allowing me another question. Uh, one thing that's often overlooked but always mentioned is the circularity or the recycling of modules. And I was wondering, out of the 50 groups, is there somebody already looking into it? Because, I mean, there's a strategy of saying, let's find something that works in technology and then figure out how to recycle it. Or uh, if I think about Pietro's talk, can we? look at the technology from a point of recycling uh, and, and circularity to say, okay, let's choose these methods and these technologies which can be more easily recycled in the end. And I think there the effort is typically much lower because it's not as exciting than uh, having record efficiencies or something like that. Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think, um, so... If you need us just there, raise your hand to okay. the answer party. Yes. Yes. yes, fantastic. If this doesn't miss me, um, so what is part of this project and, and plans are as well is to go for design for recycling, and it's just a, a small part which was I think it was actually in the slides. It's just these three words, but design for recycling really means that we think about at the start for making a module and how to design that that it's actually recyclable afterwards, and then maybe not recycling because there's more R's in the R letter, right? Because we few is reduced. But recycling is definitely part of it. And, uh, to make things sustainable, we really need to think about it upfront. Uh, but as this is also a longer timescale path, it's not in the very first part, but it, it is being continued. And at TNO, we have a, um, which is called an early stage research project, which is really about circularity and design for recycling. So there's definitely work in these 50 groups um, around yeah. the country that work on that. Yeah. Is it a can I uh, just add to that? So that uh, the project on bio-based plastics shows that this kind of expertise is often not really in those 50 research groups that we typically consider as PV research. And we really have to look for people who have expertise in those fields. So for the bioplastics, for example, we just let the question out there to the, to the solar lab PIs. And somebody knew somebody who works on bio-based plastics. And then suddenly we had some collaborator on that project. So this is also an opportunity, I think, to expand the network to other research groups that work on these topics. The last question would be for Yorick. I think we have to wrap up then. Sorry, Arthur. So this is not really a question, but more a 
it's, it seems to me that uh, the visibility of the Solar Lab network uh, needs to be expanded beyond the PI's uh, email inbox. And uh, there is a website that is uh, helpful, uh, uh, but I guess uh, uh, most PIs don't have time to update websites. And so I was wondering, uh, could there be a platform where uh, basically uh, news and new developments, new tools, new papers, new projects could be essentially uh, uh, shared uh, by all participants, and so you have a, a more uh, up-to-date uh, information sharing platform than uh, just a website. Like a Facebook for Solar Lab. Or yeah, I'm thinking. Uh, let's see. I think it's a very nice idea. Oh yeah. You should think about how to realize it. So yeah, it's a very good yeah. idea. I'm not the person to uh, suggest <laughs> <that> social <laughs> media <laughs> interaction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we need to technically think how to do that, but that's a great idea. Yeah, like a blog. Yeah. Okay, I think this was a, a great discussion, or start of a discussion, yeah. so we are now have a, a lunch break where we can continue the discussion. I hope that we continue them on a sort of topical level, yeah. post us, but also on the more general level on how to improve collaborations, and maybe we can start a few even today. As Albert said, if you want a lab tour and see what's at least available at this location, uh, you can grab anyone uh, from Amov and ask them to give you a lab tour. Um, but before we start with the lunch break, you have to take a picture. This is a long tradition of uh, LMTV Symposia with a picture. So we will go downstairs, head through the doors outside, and just before the arm of building, we assemble into a cloud of people with the speakers in the front and take a picture. Uh, and with that, I wish you all a nice lunch break.